थैंक यू थैंक यू व्यूअर्स यू आर ऑल लाइक शेयर लाइकिंग शेयरिंग एंड सब्सक्राइबिंग माई चैनल सो प्लीज वॉच द वीडियोज फ्रॉम फर्स्ट टू एंड विदाउट इंटरप्टिंग सो दैट यू विल गेट मोर अबाउट द टॉपिक एंड प्लीज लाइक शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब माई वीडियोज सो टूडे आई विल गो अमेरिकन लिटरेचर एम ई जी सिक्स ब्लॉक फोर यूनिट फाइव अमेरिकन प्रोज इन द पोस्ट सिविल वॉर पीरियड दैट इज एटीन सिक्सटी फाइव टू एटीन नाइनटीन ऑलरेडी आई हैव डिस्कस्ड यूनिट फोर ओके पोस्ट कॉलोनियल वॉर पीरियड दैट इज इन यूनिट फाइव आई विल डिस्कस अमेरिकन प्रोज इन द पोस्ट सिविल वॉर पीरियड दैट इज एटीन सिक्सटी फाइव टू एटीन नाइनटीन सो पीरियड इज वेरी मच इंपॉर्टेंट then we will go here it is a structure objectives the context of american prose in the post civil war period 1865 to 1890 the prose of samuel longhorn clemens and william den howells the prose of henry james and edith wharton the prose of some other late 19th century american writers let us sum up glossary questions and suggested readings so here it is the objective so every unit has its own objective we will go first read the objective what the objective says the aim of this unit will be to indicate the different and diverse strains of prose in america in the post civil war period that is 1865 to 1890 with special reference to qualitative variations between this prose and the prose in america in the pre civil war period the period of so called american renaissance so already you know the term renaissance so what do you mean by renaissance renaissance is the renewal or a new era okay so it is the new invention and new era in american society that is american renaissance this is called pre civil war period to the period of post war period okay so here we will go the context of american prose in the post civil war period 1865 to 1890 the 25 years between the end of the civil war and the 1890s were the period of the most profound changes america had ever seen okay so what is america had ever seen were the period the most profound changes this was as literary historians ricard rulant and macon bradbury have remarked americans victorian period celebrated in a series of great exhibitions like the great exhibition held in london in 1851 to proclaim the technological and industrial age so here it is the very important or key point that there was a great exhibition that is held in london in 1851 to proclaim the technological and the industrial age okay so here it is the great exhibition in london 1851 and the literary historians were ricard rulant and Malcolm Bradbury then in 1876 a hundred years after the declaration of independence the centennial exhibition held in philadelphia put american mechanical achievements on display a mass of wondrous machines such as thomas a edison's telegraph and alexander g bell's telephone okay so already you know who invented telephone graham bells alexander graham bells and thomas edison telegraph the spread of new land in the west was matched by transformation of land into capital the massive increase in the scale of immigration by increased mobility of national population the emergence of fresh industries by amassing of few personal fortunes a new kind of wealth and power In 1893 came the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago the dynamic city that tied west and east into a single interlinked modern economical economic and social system the historian henry adams sheen of one of the oldest american families already feeling himself displaced by the new centers of wealth and power visited the massive display housed in over 400 buildings okay the historian henry adams sheen of one of the oldest american families so who were the one of the oldest american families the historian henry adams 
you can remember the name the historian henry adams sheehan one of the oldest american families already feeling himself displaced by the new centers of wealth and power visited the massive display house in over 400 buildings with a hum of machinery in his ears adams recognized the proliferating activities and energies quite new that expressed the exp- expanding capitalism destined to displace abstract thought and all liberal disciplines of study the old agrarian society had been replaced once and for all by a new industrial society a unified process but also a complex one extending beyond traditionalist intellectual comprehension okay so the old agrarian society had been replaced one and for all the old agrarian society was there which was replaced once and for all by a new industrial society a unified process but also a complex one extending beyond traditionalist intellectual comprehension the traditionalist predicament had been predicated predicted already in the writings of american romanticism even though in this new america many pre war ethers authors and works were to be forgotten emerson and thoreau had constructed their nature and their idea of the transcendental self in part as a critic of a world devoted okay so here you can uh, you can see the two names that is emerson and thoreau had constructed their nature and their idea of the transcendental self in part as a critic of a world devoted only to material systems melville and hawthorne posited a fundamental conflict between this materialistic society and a mythicist community between the real and the imaginary both perceived the changes in consciousness that would be required to cope with a rapidly changing milieu like the transcendentalist the writers of the american romance did not fail to perceive the direction of american development okay so here you can see like the transcendentalist the writers of the american romance did not fail to perceive the direction of american development so here you can remember some names that is melville and hawthorne okay so nathaniel hawthorne already i have discussed in scarlet letter was written by nathaniel hawthorne and melville okay so here it is the name you can remember that is melville and hawthorne so posited a fundamental conflict between this materialistic society and a mythicist community between the real and the imaginary okay so like the transcendentalists the writers of the american romance did not fail to perceive the direction of american development in fact they saw more deeply into its implication than their successors yet the sense of national change was so great that in a few years their work seemed quite irrelevant the preoccupation of the post war american authors and works as in the words of the circuitic edmund clarence stedman to depict life as it is though rarely as yet in its intense phase john william de forest had set the tone in, in a manifesto essay of 1868 titled the great american novel so here it is a main key point you should remember the name john william de forest had set the tone of manifesto essay of 1868 titled the great american novel so the great american novel was written by john william de forest okay so in short you can memorize de forest john william de forest has written the great american novel okay so de forest called for a novel that would provide a picture of the ordinary emotions and manners of american existence a picture he said never yet fully drawn the great american novel must avert the subjective spirit of the american romances only a vague consciousness of this life and the expatriate withdrawal of the writer who neglected the trial of sketching american life and fled abroad for his subjects okay so expatriate withdrawal of the writer who neglected the trial of sketching american life and fled abroad for his subjects and though he admitted america was still a nation of provinces regional or cameo writing would not really serve either the need was for a novel of close empirical detail and broad social significance okay so what was the need of the novel of rose at that time the need was for a novel of close empirical detail and broad social significance 
In this, De Forest was urging the claims of the new realism that was already finding expression in the books of writers like Samuel Longhorn Clements. So here Samuel Longhorn Clements arrived. The De Forest urging the claims of new realism and expression in the books of writers like Samuel Longhorn Clements and William Dean Howells, who in different fashions where to draw the developing realistic methods of Europe into American fiction. Realism of subject matter had become a dominant characteristic of the European novel from before the mid 19th century. Flaubert and Goncourt brothers, okay, so you should remember the name Flaubert and Goncourt brothers. So here see, you can see the spelling of the writer that is Flaubert you can see they were two brothers F L A U B E R T that is Flaubert and Goncourt. Okay, Flaubert and Goncourt brothers in France asked to need to open literature to a full range of realistic social concerns. The English novelist George Eliot in Adam Bed 1859 argued the importance for fiction. For all those cheap common things which are the precious necessities of life. Okay, so English novelist George Eliot was uh, arrived, that is uh, George Eliot in Adam Bed, 1859. This was published and it is a fiction. All those cheap common things which are the precious necessities of life was written there. These and other authors like the Rossians. Tarzanev and Tolstoy point out the war way for the new American writers too. Okay, these and other authors like the Russians, Tarzanev and Tolstoy pointed out the way of for the way for the new American writers too. For as William Dean Howells declared after knowledging the importance of European developments, realism was characteristically democratic and therefore implicitly American and art of the dramas of ordinary existence. Okay, so you can see William Dean Howells declared after acknowledging the importance of European developments, realism was characteristically democratic and therefore implicitly American, an art of dreams of ordinary existence and the life of small things. In the United States, it could be an expression of optimism and even of ideality for it was, Howell said, about the more smiling aspects of life which are the more American. Taking what was familiar and local in American experience, the methods of realism could create a democratic universal. The new realism was particularly relevant for the novel the most realistic of all literary forms. The older lines of romance did not die. But in a materialistic time, it became displaced toward popular fantasy. It was realism in its various languages that became the exploring and innovative discourse of the new American writing. The prose of Samuel Longhorn Clemens and William Dean Howells. Okay, so we will read the prose of Samuel Longhorn Clemens and William Dean Howells. No writer stood to give voice to the conflicting direction and directives of American culture in the post-Civil War period more fully than the writer who took to himself the humorous name of Mark Twain. Samuel Lancon Clemens had begun his literary career by going west, lighting out for the territory like his most famous hero Huckleberry Finn. During the war, he had divided his sympathies, sliding with his siding with his native south in the beginning but afterwards moving with the alien north finally however he fixed his sights on the west his instincts were entrepreneurial his father was a specter speculator always dreaming of a fortune samuel had grown up in a hannibal on the mississippi river bank at a time when the river was still the nation's great north-south turnpike, the crossroads of slavery and abolition, a gathering place for western passages. The pre-war Mississippi Valley life was to become his waste material and acquire a pristine innocence, but it was always charged with the nation's tensions. 
His first instinct was to live on the river and as he was to explain in life on the Mississippi, 1883 he followed this instinct to the point of becoming in 1859 a licensed steamboat pilot. But he had also worked as a printer's apprentice on the local newspaper that was edited by his brother Orion. And when he went west, it was as much a journalist as a prospector. He did prospect in Nevada but joined the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise. Okay. So he did prospect in Nevada but joined the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise where he began to draw on the local humor tradition and adopted a humorous pseudonym from the river life he had left behind him. He did prospect in Nevada to join the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise where he began to draw on the local humor tradition and adopted a humorous pseudonym from the river life he had left behind him. I sat still and listened directly. I could just barely near a me yo, me yo down there. That was good, says I, me yo, me yo, as soft as I could. And then I put on the light and scrambled out of the window onto the shed. Then I slipped down to the ground and crawled in the amongst the trees and saw enough the enough there was Tom Sawyer's waiting for me. Mark Twain in Huckleberry Finn. Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer in Hannibal, the statue stands at the foot of Caddy Phil, about half a block from the site of the home of the Tom Blank Ship Blankenship, the model for Huck Finn. His early writing owed much to to the tale, tale tradition of Augustus Baldwin Longstreet, whose Georgia since 1835 lay behind much contemporary dialect humor. But there are also Actimus Ward and John Billings. And then when he moved on to San Francisco, the work of Brett Hart and Joaquin Miller, writers of Westerners. A western tall tale, the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras country, 1865, gained him a national reputation. Okay, So, which tale gave him a national reputation? The celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras country. Okay, So, you should memorize the tale. The celebrated jumping from of Calabarese country 1865 gained him a national reputation. And so in 1866, he decided to move to the east being drawn, he shared by a call to literature of a low order that is humorous. Twain's relocation signaled the start of his remarkable synthesis of the elements of post-war American writing as he undertook to link the local color and western tradition of his early work with the social spirit of the decades he himself held, named the Gilded Is. His subject matter was always to lie in the world of the west and the rural Mississippi Valley of the period before the war. Okay. His subject matter was always to lie in the world of the west and the rural Mississippi Valley of the period before the war. But the primary impetus to his writing was to come directly from the rapidly changing context of America following the war. The pre-war world was agrarian, the post-war world industrial. So here it is the main key point you can note down. The pre-war world was agrarian and the post-war world was industrial. The pre-war world he knew was based on chattel slavery. The post-world war world he would come to depend increasingly on wage slavery. Twain's eastward voice in 1866 was a journey into the deepest changes of his own contemporary culture, but he never lost the memory of more innocent data. In 1867, already an established writer, he left New York with a group of pious Easterners, drawn by the tide of a great popular movement on an extensive steamer, two to Europe and beyond Americans were looking with new veneration toward more settled cultures. Travel facilities were improving, passages growing more quick and make good effort to look at and collect art. Twain's comic report on the voyage Innocence Abroad 1869 mocks not so much European culture and customs. Okay, doing more quick and make good effort to look at collect at. 
Twain's comic report on the voyage in Ocean's abroad marks not so much European culture and customs. When I had seen one of these matters, I had seen them all. He wrote summing up the old masters in a famous phrase as innocent, American veneration, veneration of them. Okay. He wrote summing up the old masters in a famous phrase and innocent American veneration of them. But Twain was an innocent himself. His difference from his fellow passengers was that he could offer the clarity of scepticism while believing in a splendor of gay immorality that did not say it. But Twain was an innocent himself. His difference from his fellow passengers was that he could offer the clarity of scepticism while believing in a splendor of gay immortality that did not say it. Innocence thus become a form of realism, a perspective that could be used to represent America as much Europe. After the great success of Innocence Abroad, Twain wrote Roughing It, that is 1872, he published that uh, Roughing It. But it was what come, came next, the articles of old times on Mississippi, eventually life on the Mississippi, that stuck out, that staked out his essential resources, Mississippi Valley in its heyday before the war. In one sense, this was idealized, picturesque subject matter. Mississippi Valley life in its heyday before the war. That stuck out his essential resources, Mississippi Valley life in its heyday before the war. In one sense that was idealized picture skew subject matter and he partly treated it as such. But he also offered a new realizing the river was not just a landscape but a workplace, a troubled one with deceits and dangers he had plumbed himself in his training as a river boat pilot. Twain was writing of the past but his career was becoming one of the great success stories of American letters. He became an energetic Eastern businessman promoting his product through the new market in subscription sales as a powerful stage performer. He married into a wealthy coal-winning f- owning family and moved to Hatford, Connecticut, where he became rich and famous. Though he was cynical about both his fame and his riches, an entrepreneurial go-getter, he turned in effortlessly to the shifting history of his age, which he recorded. In his first novel, The Glided Age, 1873, written in collaboration with Charles Dudley Warner, the book confronted the present, looking at the period 1860-68 as one which operated institutions that were centuries old, changed the politics of a people, transformed the social life of half the country, and wrought so profoundly upon the international character that the influence cannot be measured short of sort of two or three generations. Uprooted institutions that were centuries old changed the politics of people, transformed the social life of half the half the country, and wrought so profoundly upon the international character that the influence cannot be measured short of two or three generations. A deeply revealing book it portrays the age as a great gold rush where country and city alike are packed with fortune hunters, exemplified by the figure of the confidence man Colonel Sellers. But Captain Sellers was in part Mark Twain himself, the writer as capitalist promoter, seeking to conquer the literary marketplace. Thus, Twain, the castigator of American society, was also its celebrator, never quite sure whether to comment or condemn. Twain developing, developed two warning voices, that of the humorist and that of the satirist, respectively exemplified in his two best-known novels, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 1885, both Tom and Hawk are bad boys of American gentle culture, which their creator knew only too well, but while Tom's adventures are childishly innocent and ultimately conform to the ground rules of, the, of this culture, Hawk's adventures are experientially adult and ultimately challenge the ground rules of this culture. Huckleberry Finn thus turns out to be a boy's book that is far more than a boy's book, the book with which said on Hemingway, in his famous compliment of Mark Twain, American literature really starts. Hawk's colloquial language for one thing, once for all, extends the frontiers of the language of literature in America taking it beyond the limits of polite language. For another thing, the representation of Jim as not merely a stereotyped nigger, 
but as multi multi dimensional human being introduces a radical innovation in american novelist treatment of race and race relations in american society so in huckleberry finn already i have discussed uh, discussed you go through my videos of huckleberry finn so huckleberry finn is a it's just american slavery discussion was there but more than anything else it is hawks and jim's repetition of salvation of civilization embodied in their journey together down the river that takes the adventures of huckleberry finn into regions where american prose writers has ne had never treaded before by now twain was america's leading writer the lincoln of our literature said william dean howells mark twain friend and junior fellow writer certainly twain expressed his age and its changes not only on social condition but in belief reflecting on twain's career in 1901 howells saw him as the westerner who had been forced to confront as well as to contest a world in which the natural and provincial had made, had been made obsolete okay so twain's career in 1901 powell saw him as the westerner who had been forced to confront as well as to contest a world in which the natural and the provincial had been made obsolete okay then the inventions the appliances we will go in the next videos okay so so friends please like share and subscribe study with master notes and watch the videos till end so that you will get all the notification and enjoy the videos okay so thank you thank you friends